what a great uh what a great session i certainly miss seeing all of you guys in the uh in the buff club and the the hugs and uh you know getting to catch up with everyone who we missed um gr what a great session of, of talks here and um i'm gonna take this uh the next step which you've already heard about um in regards to bone loss and there have been some hints here both in dr frank's and and dr uh, mccarty's and dr shanley's talks about about bone loss and hopefully i can decode that a little bit so my uh, my standard disclosures none are relevant here but what is instability with bone loss and what this typically is is this is this is very often recurrent shoulder instability loss of bone on the anterior inferior glenoid and what this does is this decreases the available articular arc. And so there's essentially a mismatch between the glenoid and the humeral head. And I hope for most of us that we don't figure this out when we're doing an, art, an arthroscopy like, the, uh, like you see on the screen here. And this is a situation where some of us do an arthroscopy before we do, say, a ladder J uh, to confirm that there's no other pathology. But this is a diagnosis that hopefully we can make um, after you see this talk preoperatively and we don't end up in this situation. So... We, you hear this golf ball, golf tee uh, um, analogy, and the, the anatomy of the, of the native human shoulder is actually very similar to that. And what we're talking about is for anyone who's hit, hit a great drive and you knock a small corner of the golf tee off, is that you know that the ball is not going to stay on that tee after you knock the corner of the, uh, of the tee off. So that, that's the exact concept here. And so the arc length is decreased, the ball is going to fall off, hence the, the problem that we, that we typically have. Patient history, as Dr. Frank touched on, is really critical here. So this is often status post a high, high energy dislocation. Oftentimes there's been an initial bony bank hurt, which Dr. Shanley pointed out. And the people that worry me, so the people that should cue those red flags, multiple dislocations with recurrent instability and increasing ease of dislocation. So the exact patient that you may think, oh, this, this story sounds a little bit fishy, right? Like I sneeze and my shoulder dislocates or I roll over in bed. That's the exact patient that should really perk your ears up and things like instability in the mid range of motion when they start getting unstable, not needing to bring their arm all the way back and up, but that their arms coming out in that 20 to 60 degree range. And then we'll talk about some imaging based things. So the point here though, is that this is ultimately a radiographic diagnosis. So we need good radiographs, we need good 3D imaging, and we need to know how and what exactly we're evaluating. So why is this important? All the way back to Carter Rowe in the late 70s, he recognized in his open bank heart series that if they had greater than 30% measured with a, with a ruler at the time of open surgery, that they had an increased failure rate. Burkhart and De Beer took that a step further, and this is the classic article in 2000 of the inverted pair glenoid that has already been mentioned, but that there's failure of an arthroscopic bank heart, especially in the contact athletes of 89% versus only 6% with or without bone loss, respectively. Pascal Boileau took this a step further in 2007 and tried to quantify who's going to benefit or who's going to say have a worse outcome with an arthroscopic procedure in the setting of known bone loss. And then the, the biomechanics are really what's shown to be the, really the critical problem here. And so I'll present here very quickly the instability severity index. And what this showed essentially is that looking at a set of patient factors that they have when they're seeing you immediately in the office, based on age, sports participation, contact or not, hyperlaxity, what their radiograph looks like, both on the hill sacs, humeral side, and the glenoid side, that <clears throat> if patients had a score greater than six, this predicted a 70% chance of failure with arthroscopic bank heart. So many have taken this since 2007, that a score perhaps greater than four should indicate someone for a ladder J or a bony procedure. I will point out that almost every single one of our high school athletes with a primary dislocation in the setting has a score over four to begin with. So this, I see Dr. Shanley shaking her head that this is, this is that every single one of our contact athletes in high school with a primary dislocation is going to end up with a ladder J, which I'm not sure is the right procedure, but we need to make sure we know exactly what we're evaluating here. So the biomechanics are that the effect of glenoid defect on instability is really significant. And you see the plane of this is important. They showed that a 21% defect will cause instability and range of motion problem with an isolated bank heart repair. The problem with that is that you see the bottom right red line was what had been modeled 
in the lab, but clinically we didn't see that. So this basically needed to be redone. And Yamamoto's group redid this with a different plane showing now that that number went down to 19% to change the stability ratio biomechanically in the shoulder. So what you see is above 20%, now it's coming down to 19%. And we're getting a better sense of Christian Gerber showing us that if we have a ratio of the radius that's greater than the bony Bankart piece, this decreases the risk of recurrence or of instability by, by 70%. The force decreases to push the shoulder out. So we're getting a sense that we need to understand where exactly that bone piece is and how large it is. How do we measure this? So CT and oftentimes CT arthrogram is the study of choice. 3D CT has been shown to be the most accurate method, which you see on the right, uh, the, excuse me, the left-hand uh, slide there. MRI is okay. So uh, our colleagues at NYU showed that there's about a 3% error with MRI utilizing the circle method compared to, C to CT scan, particularly 3D CT. I can still tell you that in my practice, 3% may actually change my management. So I think it's really critical if you're considering these options that you absolutely need to have the best study possible. This is the way that I think most of us measure um, bone loss and the way that I use uh, bone loss measurements, which is the circle method. I, a circle should portend the bottom two thirds of the anatomic glenoid. The missing piece becomes a percentage of that circle and that's how we measure our bone loss. What about the humeral side? So this is frequently neglected. The Hillsack's compression fracture is present in almost all episodes of instability. There's going to be some effect if the shoulder came out or even subluxated, uh, our buddy Dean Taylor showed that even if they don't require a formal reduction maneuver, they still can have all of the same pathology if they describe an instability episode. Traditionally, if that's less than 20%, we'd completely ignore it. If it's 20 to 40%, it may require intervention. And I'll get to that in a minute. 40% almost always require treatment. And that may be something big like an OC allograft, an arthroplasty in certain cases. And then there's this concept of if they're engaging, which I personally think is kind of bogus because if it, if it was there at some point in life, it was engaging. It touched the front of the glenoid. It had to happen somewhere. So this may be that we can't reproduce their arm position. We can't reproduce their exact velocity or energy to produce that in the OR, but it doesn't mean that we, have, then we, that we can ignore it. This then I'll go to the concept of the glenoid track. And this is a newer concept that Yamamoto and, and uh, Ije Itoi proposed that describes the hill sacs in a more three-dimensional and interactive phase with the glenoid. And what this shows is that the arm in a 60 degree abducted maximum externally rotated position, that the, the distance to the infraspinatus is within 83% of the glenoid width. So what that means is that, a, like you see above, if that defect is within 83% of the glenoid width, it will stay on the glenoid and will not fall off. The picture on the bottom, you see that that's further towards the articular surface, farther away from the infraspinatus footprint, and thus that defect falls over the edge of the glenoid, thus making this what we call an off-track lesion. So it's a three-dimensional representation of both sides, bipolar, on the glenoid and the humeral side, combined to know if, if that's going to engage dynamically for this patient and if that needs addressing. So what have we done with that? Well, Gene Wolfe really art beautifully described a concept called remplissage, which is French to fill. These are arthroscopic pictures of a patient that I did a remplissage on. This is an arthroscopic image of me placing an anchor within the hill sacs, passing suture through the infraspinatus and the capsule, and then tying that capsule up to essentially fill the remplissage or fill the, fill the hill sacs defect with this remplissage. We've shown that we can do this successfully without restriction of external rotation or low recurrence of instability. And this is an algorithm now back to the instability uh, severity index, where we show with an isolated humeral bone defect, not on the glenoid side, that Bankart plus remplissage is the appropriate treatment. You can see farther on the right, 
combined humeral glenoid bone defect is not an indication or a solution here. So what I want to point out is that remplissage is not a solution for critical glenoid bone loss. That does not solve the problem. And there is some bet hedging going on with a lot of surgical treatment now thinking about this, that we can solve glenoid bone loss with a remplissage, which is not factual. That's, that's never been demonstrated. I would say here that what is critical glenoid bone loss? And this has changed. So this has gone from 25% with, uh, with Burkhardt and De Beer, now all the way down to 13% from our buddy, John Tokish, who showed that not, they may not have a redislocation difference, but they have a clinical outcome difference, meaning they don't trust their shoulder all the way down to 13% of bone loss. So I think we're really defining that we may have a bigger problem than we think here. So what are we going to do about it? We got to restore the glenoid arc. We have Latterge, we have ilia crest bone graft, and now distal tibia. We even have now um, the addition of autograft, distal clavicle is being used, or, or spine of the scapula. The Latterge is a coracoid transfer where we take the uh, coracoid with the in intact conjoint tendon. We get this triple blocking effect. And this is a highly successful operation, but there's a limit. And so with the 30% defect, Godadra showed us that we can only re restore so much. So you have to know there may be a limit to this. And if we need free graft, the ilia crest is excellent. This is called the Eden Hibernate. And we, we've shown um, with uh, two of my former mentors that patients can be successfully treated with a free graft. What about distal tibia allograft? So our own Dr. Frank has pioneered some of this work with um, her colleagues uh, at both uh, Rush and uh, up in Vail, showing excellent results with distal tibia allograft, equivalent to the latter J with a low set of recurrence. And this has even been taken a step further with now their arthroscopic techniques. So our, their arthroscopic latter J can be performed. And a newer concept that I've been using that I think is probably gonna be a more significant tool in my toolbox moving forward is the, for the bet headers, the ones like Dr. McCarty was saying, they have a little bit of bone loss. You don't want to do an open stabilization because of the potential morbidity. Maybe we can add arthroscopically a free bone block, but with a bank heart repair. And this is a case that I did recently, first time operation, but 16% bone loss. So what do you do with this kid? So these are pictures of his arthroscopic procedure, big capsular deficiency, flat anterior glenoid, anchors and a guide in the front. I pull an autographed bone. This is actually dis distal autographed distal clavicle in arthroscopically, and then a bank heart over the top of that. So this maybe adds 30 to 40 minutes to this operative procedure, a little bit of increased complexity, but I think this is going to be a great next step in regards to our treatment algorithm. Outcomes of this, latter J Bristow, I want to point out simply the low recurrence. And in this systematic review of 3,200 patients, arthroscopic latter J actually had the lowest of recurrence rates at 3%, no difference in osteoarthritis. 100 patients with two-year follow-up showing that maybe our higher level competitive athletes may do better overall than our recreational athletes though both with very good return to play and very low recurrence rates of 2 and 3% respectively. A comment that was already brought up is that it's not all roses. And so what are the North Americans here afraid of? Well, this is, this is, a, this is a valid point. Out of 4,200 procedures, the bone block versus a soft tissue repair had a tenfold increase in complications. So you have got to know what you're doing and we've got to make the right decisions for the right reasons because the open particularly bone block procedures absolutely expose our patients to higher risk. And the problem is those risks can potentially be catastrophic in these patients. So we know 30% predicts failure of open bank heart. Now 18 to 20% has a biomechanical change. Now maybe JT shows us it's 13%. Where's this going? And so perhaps the next phase here is that we need to demand match our patients. So maybe the throwers that need all their motion, they get an arthroscopic stabilization. Our somewhat higher level athletes with particularly humeral sided defects need remplissage. And then our contact and, and more higher level um, ballistic athletes, maybe they need a bony reconstruction or maybe a hybrid like I showed. This has been taken further now, the glenoid tract instability management score, and this is an addition to the instability severity index. The bottom line here is that the better we get at evaluating their 
that what they have by imaging, we can pr appro more appropriately stage what they need. And in this study, they saved about half the patients a latter J and had equal outcomes. So in summary, bone loss is a significant risk of recurrent instability. Scoring systems are a guide. They're not a law. So we need to be really cognizant of what we're doing and why we're treating what. Beware of the warning signs. Make decisions by imaging in the office. Understand most defects are combined and they interact in a three-dimensional way and that there are multiple excellent options for glenoid reconstruction, all of which have good, good results. Thank you very much.